Good morning. Um, contrary to some rumors I heard uh, before this talk, the title of this talk does not, is not derived from the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie of the same title. But anyway, my name is Peter Eisentraut. Uh, Peter Eisentraut. I work for this company there. I was involved in the uh, installation of various large email filter systems for companies and government agencies in Germany. And from, the, uh, from those experiences, I also wrote a book about spam and virus filtering. It's not supposed to be an advertisement, so I'm not going to go into details. During this research and uh, the consultant, consultancy work, I noticed some things about uh, developments in spam and virus filtering that I really did not like. And I did not find any real uh, thorough treatment on those, so I set out to kind of make my own notes. And this talk is sort of the byproduct of that research. So this is where we are today. It happens to be that this is the year 12 of spam, if you believe the legends that the first spam was sent in 1994 on Usenet. And this is also the year 24 of the SMTP era, based on the public publication of the f first RFC on SMTP. So if you uh, count that up, then you can see that pretty much for m from now on, for more than half of its lifetime, email has been hampered by a spam problem. But if you think about it, just SMTP is no longer email. You cannot no longer just take an SMTP implementation and put it on the internet and hope to communicate reasonably with other people. There is now on top of that an additional layer of spam filter system, virus filter system, all kinds of other uh, defense mechanisms that are essentially de facto part of the email system nowadays. Everybody has them, but contrary to SMTP and other standards, those filter systems are not standardized by anyone. Everyone can implement their own and do what they like. They're not verified by anyone. There's no accountancy of what you're doing. Most of the time, or usually they're not even announced that they're there. So you sell, tell people, send me email to this email address, and you say, okay, this guy probably has an SMTP server at that email address, but they're not going to tell you how they filter the, uh, your email. So you really have a hard time getting your email through. And even worse, most of these filter systems are completely unpredictable by both the sender and the receiver. They f consult external lists and they uh, have behavior changing over time based on statistical filter system and all these things that you know. So really today, email, getting email through is a challenge. And uh, this talk is about why that is and, and what I think about that. So here are a couple of filter system, uh, filtering techniques that people have used or that are, people are considering right now that uh, I find uh, questionable. Some of, the, uh, some of them are kind of obvious if you know them, but some of them you might wonder why they are here and uh, I'm gonna explain why, the, why they are here. The second part of this talk is a couple of uh, legal issues that are also uh, of concern to me. And, but first, the technical side. So the DNS black hole list, everybody knows them. They are sort of the first technique specifically invented uh, to fight spam. The way this works is you collect a, a list of problem hosts uh, uh, respective to your problem, and your problem is for filter, uh, fighting spam or viruses. So you collect hosts that you think have a spam problem. And you, uh, you publish that list somehow on the internet. And you can imagine other ways to publish these lists, but for some reason they chose to publish that via the domain name system. And every ma mail server on the internet can query those lists. And if a host mm -hmm. is listed, then according to the theory, you can just block email from that host. Now, in the beginning, this was sort of reasonable. The first uh, DNS black hole list was the MAPS RBL. And they had a very conservative policy. They, they did inspections all manually, and they tried to contact the, uh, the offending, uh, the hostmaster of the offending site and try to explain the problem. And then if they did not react in a reasonable way, they ended up being listed. And that was reasonable. In those days, most of the people on the internet used send mail, and send mail back in those days was 
by default configured as an open relay, so there was a lot of open relays on the internet being uh, abused to send spam. And so the uh, MAPS RBL was sort of as much, uh, as much a spam fighting mechanism as much as an education program to educate people about the problem of open relays. And the open relay problem nowadays is pretty much gone. Even SendMail and all the other MTAs that you use have safe default configuration, more or less. And, and if you have an open relay or a related problem, you really got there on purpose. The spam problem nowadays is uh, zombies. Most of spam is nowadays sent through zombies. I've heard figures about 80% or more. And this is only going to get worse. Zombies are hosts, just regular dial-up PCs that are taken over by a virus and are commanded by whoever wants to send junk email. And it's, nowadays, it's impossible to do manual inspections just because of the sheer volume. The internet has grown a lot over the last 10 years. And uh, that's why most of the DNS black hole lists nowadays are fully automated. There are some where you can actually, everything you submit is automatically listed, and everything you nominate for deletion is automatically deleted. So that's, that's particularly bad. Some of them do. Uh, most of them actually do some kind of testing. They do some kind of relay testing. They send out an email, and if they get it back, then that's that you get listed. So that's the situation. Why is that a problem? The problem with these things is that they do not discriminate between temporary problems and permanent problems, or between ill will, if you like. And for that reason, if you, even if you just have a problem of five minutes and you get tested during that time, then you might, get list, you might be listed and you cannot get off that list or you don't even know that you're listed. Or it might take you weeks to get off a list or you might even have to pay for that. And probably for reasons related to that or for whatever other reasons, large ISPs get regularly blocked by these lists. I know in Germany, GMX is blocked by everybody. Um, for reasons I don't understand. I mean, they have smart people there probably too. But as I said, most of the spam is uh, nowadays not sent through regular email servers that are open relays or have some problem of that sort, but instead they're sent through zombies on dial-up accounts. And tracking dial-up accounts through a DNS-based uh, listing system is more or less useless because, the first of all, most uh, dial-up users change uh, dial-in again every day, every 24 hours, and never get a new IP address. And on top of that, DNS has a propagation delay of about 24 hours. So most of your data, and if you choose to track dial-up accounts at all in your DNS black hole list, then most of the data in there is just out of date by 24 hours on average. Or if you do not track dial-up accounts in your list, then you, know, you miss out on, if you believe my numbers, 80% of your spam problems. So really what, uh, what this comes down to is that DNS black hole lists nowadays have a low correlation with the actual occurrence of spam or junk email, meaning both m not, all of, not exactly all of your listings are a spam problem because you just list them because of some configuration problem that may or may not actually result in spam occurrence. And on the other hand, you also miss a lot of spam sources on these dial-up accounts. So you really have both a, low, uh, both a high false positive and a high false negative rate, and that is really the worst combination. On top of that, DNS as a protocol, as a distribution mechanism for information is uh, pretty insecure. I don't want to get into the detail of that. There are entire conferences on why DNS is insecure and what to do about that. It is, in a way, it's amazing that this has not become a problem really in large scale. But you can imagine all kinds of attacks, denial of service attacks, or adding or removing information on these lists by just hacking into DNS. So my opinion on all this is that using DNS black hole lists in the original way, if it's listed, then you just block the communication with that host altogether. That is completely inappropriate today. DNS black hole lists do remain useful in a sort of secondary way. You can use them in some sort of a weighted scoring system like Spam Assassin has, where uh, a listing is sort of gets like one point or a low point uh, percentage of the entire points that you need to block an email. I guess they're still useful in, in that way to figure in with all these other spam filter mechanisms that you have. But 
by themselves, I think they're entirely inappropriate and will get even more so as the zombie problem continue, continue, continues to grow. The second problem, and I think everybody has experienced that, bounce message has gone wild. Why is that? Uh, this is the, uh, on top you see the original concept how, of how email was supposed to work. So first host A sends, wants to send a message to host B. And then host B checks the message if it likes it. And this usually involves at least checking the uh, recipient address to see if it's a local user or if it's an unauthorized re relay attempt. And then host B says either it accepts, accepts the message and sends it to the uh, final destination or it rejects the message. And then host A can react to that rejection and in turn inform the user and that the message did not get through. The problem with that is that as you add spam filters, virus filters, or what have you in step two, the checking keeps taking longer and longer and then host A starts to time out so you don't get any email through at all. So, what people did, they thought up this uh, new concept down there. <coughs> host A sends a message to host, host B, and then host B does little or no checking at all. They still check for um, unauthorized relay attempts usually, but that's really all they do, and then they put the message in the queue, and then the so-called after queue filtering, they check the message whenever they want later on when the low, load is low, or forward it to a different host and do the checking there in a sort of parallelized fashion. And then when host B or the cluster nodes behind them uh, decide that the um, message is unacceptable, they supposedly send a rejection message to the sender, but if you know the email protocols at all, there's now no chance at all anymore to actually know who the sender was. So this does not work. So as you all know, all junk email fake sender addresses. So. All these rejection messages go to innocent users, so there's a 100% failure rate of this mechanism. And in addition to that, users are now starting, or have already started a while ago, to actually reject rejection messages, filter rejection messages as a sort of spam on their own part. I know, well, there's different ways to do that. I know some people who actually just reject all bounce messages completely, and that, of course, reduces the reliability of the whole email system dramatically. I have thought of my own way, which only works in my own house, and you probably have figured out too how you can filter your email, uh, your bounce messages from your email. But it's really hard to do in general. So what do you do, going back to this, what do you do if you do not uh, want to send a rejection message in step three down there? There's Alternatives, well, you can just discard all the messages you don't like. That, of course, reduces the reliability of the email system. Also, you can do that on your private server, I guess, but if you are responsible for an ISP or an organization, then that's, of course, inappropriate. A quarantine system where you keep the email in a sort of separate uh, mailbox, and if it turns out that the filter system got it wrong, you can still get it out of there. That works reasonably well in balance. If you have a sort of a, a limited user population, then this is manageable, but if you're just a large ISP, then you can't just, you know, keep a quarantine for all your users and have, you know, a staff of dozens of people manage the quarantine. There's also privacy issues with that, too. So, what to do? Well, fix the MTA timeouts. That's what I would suggest doing, and that is actually possible. Because most of the time, the MTA is not your Outlook client, which you obviously cannot fix, but it's some sort of a different, uh, it's a different MTA which forwards it to the next MTA. And that one you can, of course, configure, or if it's open source, you can just fix the, uh, the code, or that is, is easily doable. The other problem, and it actually is the worst problem here, is that the spam filter, most spam filter software is just terribly implemented, and has, um, it's just, has loads of features, it's bloatware, and it, it's poorly implemented in terms of performance and scalability. And that's why these timeouts happen that I talked about here. So what I suggest we uh, tackle in, in the near future is just fixing filter, pro uh, filter programs for performance. We have now pretty much, in the last couple of years, we got a new filter technique every other week, so we kept adding on to that and on to that and added new, uh, added new uh, configuration options so people can configure it every way they want to now. And 
now it has more or less settled down in a way, I think. And so what I would suggest now, the next step should be there is to uh, fix the performance of filtering software so we can go back to the original concept and actually do the checking here in, where is it, at this point, and do not have to do this uh, fake uh, after Q uh, filtering. What is particularly concerning here is that even uh, a lot of software still operates in this uh, mode down here that they send rejection messages to the fake sender addresses. And this is not only commercial software which are clueless or just reacting to marketing demands, even uh, popular open source software like Amavis is still configured by default to send rejection messages as of a couple of weeks ago. That's a scandal in my mind. So you know how to do this, but um, configure your software correctly. Graylisting. Graylisting is actually nice, but there's problems with that too. How graylisting works is if you install a graylisting mechanism on your mail server, then the mail server sends to all new email sends a temporary error on first contact, which would be a 400 type of error code. And then a normal SMTP client is instructed to try again later, and that's usually in about 15 minutes or so. But spamming software, especially these uh, virus-borne zombie uh, spamming software, does not do that. So that email is just lost, which is what you want. And that turns out to be extremely effective in some installations we manage. We've seen just the email volume drop by 80% just because of that. And I've seen other reports of other people, uh, approximately those same numbers. When I first of all heard about graylisting about two, two and a half years ago, I thought, well, this is nice, but in about three months, people are gonna, spammers are gonna fix their software and this is all gonna be over. But for some reason, they have not. I don't know any spammers, so I don't know why they did that. I can only imagine that this is not a problem for them. So graylisting is not used as much as one would like, but the problems with graylisting are many. As I said, the concept is sound in a way, even though you're abusing the protocol in a way, it's, it's still correct. You're still dealing with the protocol correctly in, in, uh, with the letter of the standard. But there are a lot of configuration problems that you might encounter. The first problem that we encountered about, about two, two and a half years ago is that most of gray listing software is just really poorly implemented. When the concept came out, the concept is really simple and you can implement that in about a couple of hours, I guess but getting it right with all the corner cases is a problem. And everybody wanted to have the gray listing implementation out in a few weeks, I suppose, and they were just full of security problems, buffer overflows, SQL injection, and everything you've seen. And most of those were just uh, two or three files of C code, and if you find about uh, three or four uh, security exploits in each file, that's a problem. The other thing, it, it, they don't part scale particularly well, and really, if you consider gray listing, really check out what software you're using because a lot of it is just really bad. If you have some kind of, if you're a large organization, you probably have some kind of server pools or clusters or something of that sort, either on the sender or on the recipient side, and those cause problems. If you have a sender pool, if you have a server pool on the sender side, as many large ISPs, for example, AOL is the canonical example for that, they have that. Then on the remail attempt, on the second attempt to send the email, you have probably a different source IP address. And then the host would get uh, gray listed again. So what you do here is usually that you uh, do not, in your gray listing database, you do not enter the IP address, but that you enter maybe the class C network of the whole sender IP address. And you have to keep a list of wh for which networks you have to do that. It's a, it's a manual hassle. On the recipient side, um, you have the inverse problem. If on the remail attempt, your uh, connection goes to a different, uh, a different node in your uh, server pool, then that server might not know that the, that the uh, email already got there 15 minutes earlier. So what you have to do there is either you could imagine that you do a kind of, a, you do not do a round robin or a load balancing in, in the strict sense, but you decide which node to go through based on the source IP address. That might work, but it doesn't work if you have a server pool on the sender side. 
So what you have to do is you sort of have to share your gray listing database between all those nodes, which is, of course, a scalability problem. Then there's broken MTAs, which do, just do not retry after a temporary error. There's uh, the canonical example for that is the Yahoo Groups um, site. And you might think you do not care about Yahoo Groups, but maybe your users do, so. And there's more of that, too. There's the other problem is uh, related to that is middle listing software, which does, has a new sender address on each send, uh, sending attempt. They put some sort of numbers or some sort of code into the sender address. And you have to keep a, a list of, of sites that do that, too. So you have now about well, these four different cases, and there's more, but those are the canonical cases in a way. You have to keep a, a white list or a, a, at least a list of sites that do that in order not to, uh, so they can circumvent your gray listing um, um, implementation. And there's a list you can download of that from graylisting.org, but you would think they, that list would have stabilized, but if you look, they have a CBS there or an SVN maybe nowadays, and they keep committing into that with new entries every, day, every other day. So you really have to stay on top of these things. Another problem with uh, gray listing is, in general, is time critical emails. For example, uh, the uh, canonical example of that is the eBay emails that you, your, your auction is or your bid is about to expire or what have you. And well, what you could do there is you could also whitelist email from eBay, but then, of course, 50% of all spam probably fake sender addresses with the eBay, eBay domain. So that really would not work well. So if you have time critical emails with eBay or some other large site, I, I guess you can't really use gray listing. Another, well, rare, rarer problem is multi-stage relays. If you have just have a series of servers that your email goes through, of course, you, you should not gray list in each one of them. That is just something you have to consider also in the configuration. So what I think, well, if on your, on your private server or on your small group, maybe gray listing works, or if you have a, if you manage a server of a company, and you know all people only have, use email for company pur purposes, and, and you can, they don't use eBay at work, maybe gray listing is appropriate, but just for general ISP, or if you have a diverse user population which have different needs, I, I think gray listing just can't be used reasonably, which is unfortunate, but um, do, do be careful if you consider gray listing. <laughs> The latest or the latest but one uh, idea to fight spam is SPF, which is used to stand for sender committed from, now it stands for sender policy framework. And the way this works is um, the owner of a domain can control which mail servers you can use for email. As it stands now, you can send email through any mail server you want to, subject to authentication or relaying checks. But now the owner of a domain, the one who registers the domain, can publish a so-called SPF record, um, again, via the domain name system, for lack of a better alternative. And that uh, record identifies, lists all the valid servers that you are allowed to send outgoing mail through for this domain. And then under the theory, every recipient of email checks for SPF records of the sender address. And under the strict theory, we would then reject email from, that comes from senders, uh, from hosts that are not valid outgoing mail servers for that domain. And a lot of sites actually do hard rejections based on that. Then there's actually two alternatives or two um, sort of impl separate implementations of this idea. The uh, original SPF checks the envelope sender address there is the alternative sender ID, which is uh, championed by Microsoft, uh, which has a, sep a different uh, internal uh, record format too. They do not check the sender envelope address, they check the email content, so they would check all these different lines, sender from, and all these things, and would kind of try to guess which is the most likely uh, sender address. Those are two different um, uh, ways to go about that. Sender ID is the problem that there's also patent problems and licensing, licensing problems from Microsoft, so it's not used all that much outside of Microsoft. But they're sort of the same idea. The problem with SPF, it doesn't fight any spam at all. 
because if you're a spammer, then you would just use a different domain. If you are, you have a, as a spammer, you have a list of, of email addresses or domains that you might like to use in your fake, your sender email address scheme. And then for spammer, it's, it's trivial to just, before using a, a domain, check if there's an SPF record, and if, if there is, just don't use it. So that's, that's fully automated, and I suppose spammers do that, so that's just a total waste of time then. Of course, spammers can also publish their own SPF records, and they, and they do that. They register their own domains for the purpose of, you know, what they selling their products, and they can publish SPF records for their own domain, hosting their shops. So there's absolutely nothing that SPF, if spammers are not completely stupid and send spam th using domains that have SPF records, if they're not that stupid, then, spam, uh, then SPF does not do anything at all against spam. If you go to the SPF website, which is openspf.org nowadays, you will see what they actually say is uh, SPF is a sender policy framework to uh, prevent email forgery. So they actually, if you read between the lines, they know it doesn't fight spam, it only prevents email forgery. And it actually does that in a way, but you might think SPF does something against phishing, but if you think about it, the envelope address, nobody ever sees the envelope address in your email client, you don't, you don't see the envelope uh, address, so it does not do anything that the user can notice. There's no noticeable difference for the user whether the email uh, sender address of the email was forged or not, so that's also pretty useless. Sender ID is better in that regard. I don't, I don't have any practic practical experience with sender ID, but it would seem to be a better approach to actually fight this phishing problem. <coughs> what SPF does uh, prevent, in a way, is the following. If you are uh, an ISP and you have a domain and uh, for a lo lo large ISPs, the domain is often abused in, uh, for email forgery attacks, so AOL and all these kinds of things. You have sender addresses with AOL, which are faked. And by publishing an SPF record, the ISP can sort of prevent that people do that. So if you publish an SPF record, and if you're a spammer and you follow that advice up there, then people would use a different domain. So you kind of protect your own domain against being abused by fake, uh, for faking email address schemes. And that is really the only thing that it does. And I suppose that's the reason why these large ISPs publish SPF records, all of them together. Because it kind of protects the integrity or the reputation of their domain. But it does not do anything at all against the actual phishing problem or virus or sending spam. On the other hand, what it does is it breaks the conventional email protocols in various ways. For example, it breaks uh, forwarding. Forwarding meaning something like your dot .forward file that you forward from your own one Unix account maybe to a different email address or from your dot .proc mail RC configuration or any other kind of forwarding scheme like that. Because then your own, this uh, host that you forward from would probably no longer be a, an authenticated, an authorized um, uh, sending email host in that domain, unless you can convince your large ISP to add your own uh, personal machine into the SPF records, which is not likely to happen. And there is, is supposed to be a way around that, the sender rewriting scheme, which nobody has implemented so far. There's patches out there for all the different MTAs. <laughs> but it's not available really. So it basically just breaks forwarding right now. What ISPs can now do is they can control which way people send email. If you, uh, until now you could pick any email server you want to for sending your email, but now if you, if you use the domain of your ISP, if you have some sort of username at, I don't know, T online or whatever email address, <coughs> the ISP can now say you have to send your email through this mail server that we like and we put there. And that is a problem, that could be a problem for you for various reasons. For example, if that particular email server through stupidity is on a DNS black hole list, you have no way around that anymore now. Because if you send it a different route, then the sender might block it because you have SPF records. And they can also do other kinds of things. You can imagine they could put advertisements in the bottom of the email, which you can no longer prevent. They can, of course, they can record all your email traffic, and, and since a week ago, we know that they will record all your email traffic, so you have no way around that anymore. You cannot install your own email server or any of the other suggestions that, that were offered yesterday in, in another talk. And again, 
DNS is a fairly insecure protocol, and the more services we stack on top of DNS, the more likely it is that there's uh, going to be a large-scale problem one of these days. So really, the only thing I have to say about SPF or sender IDs, do not use it. Do not publish any SPF records, because that just encourages people to use them. And do not, under any circumstances, filter your email because of SPF. Unfortunately, now, uh, since uh, Spam Assassin even now does SPF filtering by default, I think, since version 3, so I don't know what they were thinking, but please consider carefully anything you do with F SPF. This is the uh, latest idea. Actually, it's a, a fairly old idea, but this is uh, probably going to happen more nowadays uh, to fight spam. Blocking port 25. This means that on regular dial-up accounts, uh, the ISP blocks the port 25 for outgoing connections. And this is reasonable. If you, if you consider what I said earlier, that most junk email nowadays is sent by zombies, which are cracked home user PCs, and they are using current mechanisms they are hard to track because the, uh, the, um, the IP address changes, changes every 24 hours, and you do not have any chance to track them through uh, DNS-based black hole lists. And even, even if you could track them, the spammers couldn't just switch to the next set of uh, zombies. They have thousands and thousands of, of these machines available, and they, if the first thousand are listed, they just uh, use the next one, next thousand. And you can rent them, and they are rented out by people, and so there's absolutely no problem. If, even if you could track zombies, there's, this would not uh, do any significant uh, impact. So what they are proposing now, what they're already doing in, in certain areas, is that they block the port 25 for outgoing traffic, except to the designated email server of the ISP, which supposedly has some sort of rate controls or some checks of various kinds. So there's a, a little bit more security. And this is actually not so bad because for a, it actually indirectly adds more security to, for the regular end users, the dial-up users of that particular ISP because a, a, well, a virus writer or someone who tries to target these uh, machines for, for owning them is um, really, they're not, no longer an attractive target for doing that because well, even if you could, um, have take control of these machines. You cannot really do the things you want anymore. Of course, there are other way, other things you can do uh, uh, if you have taken control of a, of a PC. But for the purpose of sending out email, they are no longer that attractive. So, of course, viruses do not really discriminate on on that level. But there's a certain extra level of security for for your end users. So. I, Again, as I said, it's, it's not all that a uh, bad idea, but there's, uh, of course, also problems with that. If you want to use email accounts other than the one that your ISP gives you, you know, the regular average users maybe has the dial-up account or the DSL account nowadays, which is also dial-up, at a certain ISP and also has the email, email address there. But if you have more than one email account or you just get your email somewhere else, then you have a problem because you are forced to send all your email through your ISP, but if you use a different domain or you have a work account or you have more accounts for other projects or where you contract or what have you, then you have a problem because you're supposed to use that ISP, uh, that domain's mail server according to their policy and according to the policy of your ISP, you have to send email through that mail server. The workaround that is uh, proposed or that is implemented is that the ISPs allow you to route every, any email you want through their mail server subject to authentication and that works. But again, now ISPs have the power over you to control where you send your email. You can no longer use your own email server for reasons that I mentioned previously. You can no longer install your own mail server software, your own filtering systems, and you, if the ISP is blacklisted, you have no way to get around that. Or if you just want to prevent that, all your communication is locked, which it will be. And all of this is also completely incompatible with the SPF that I just explained, because SPF tells you you have to send your email through which what the owner of the domain says. And on the other hand, this concept says that you have to send your email through the, what the ISP says. And if those two are not talking to each other, with the, which they likely will not, then you have a problem that you just can't send email anymore for certain domains. 
so what I suggest about this is, um, and this is will likely happen because people are talking about this now, and, and in the U.S. for certain email servers, it's already happening. Yes, question. Uh, was SMTPS, uh, also yeah, but no. The question, was, the question was, or the comment was about SMTPS, but I don't know what exactly you mean by that, or how that figures in here. Going through a different port, you mean? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that's really what I, what I was going to say. Is uh, yesterday, I don't know uh, what was his name, Brent De Winter, who talked about the uh, data retention uh, um, legislation in the U EU, and he suggested you just use a different port. If you if you send all your stuff through port 26 or 24, then it's not considered email anymore, and it's not locked. And the same really applies here. If you can just use a different port, put your own email server out in the internet, and use a different port, or use other SMTP-like protocols that go through different ports, and I guess they can also block all the other kinds of ports, obviously. But what this, uh, what this does is, um, obviously, spammers are interested in spamming people who use port 25, right? So this will actually, this will actually prevent spam. Of course, you have workarounds. I mean, we always have workarounds. We can tunnel anything through anything. So. But for the average user or people who do not want to spend all their time setting up hosts in different countries and all that, this is uh, going to be a problem, especially if you add up other restrictions like SPF and, and things that can happen. Of course, we always have workarounds. There's no, not ever going to be a way where you say, I cannot do anything anymore. But there's just going to be more and more problems uh, that people are facing. So what I, I would uh, suggest here, if you're interested in that or if you're considering doing that, even if you work in ISP, I would not actually mind if this happened, but then you have to give your users the option of opting out of that with no questions asked and no fees being paid or anything you might consider. So if the user can just go there, call you up, or go into a, some sort of management interface and say, I do not want my ports blocked, then opt out of that. Then, then that, I think that would work. But, you know, who is going to do that? Large ISPs, they just block everything, and then people are going to be happy, I guess. So I don't know if this is happening in, in Europe already, but I know this in, in the U.S. certain ISPs have at least done that a few years ago and uh, have had problems with that. They do, uh, AOL does it in, in Germany, Europe also? Okay. Australia, it's been widely done for many years. I've been on this for about four or five years, something yeah, like that. This has uh, been going on for a, a while now in certain areas, but uh, I was at a conference uh, in September on uh, spam issues where a lot of government uh, people were there, and they are now discussing making this a, well, they can't force you to do it, I guess, or they could try to, but this is going to be sort of like the official recommendation nowadays or something like that. So but, it but might happen in more places. Personally, I think back, this is back in the sort of the really big um, Outlook virus time. I think it helped a lot just on the, you could send mail once they started blocking ports because not everything was filled with junk suddenly. So I think in general it's a, it's a good thing just for server load reasons. Yeah. So yeah, this is, this is not bad, but you'd have to give people in, in, in a way to opt out of that, I, I, I would think. So this is just, uh, this. Uh, the next thing is uh, challenge response <coughs> systems, and, and I think most of you have dealt with these at one time or other. other. And this is just really bad. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of gray listing on a different level, if you like. The way it works is uh, when you were sent, or when the user of that system would uh, receive an email, they would send you back a challenge email, which most of the time, if you, you have to answer the challenge, which most of the time is just replying to the email or clicking on the link or Maybe you have to solve a puzzle or something like that. But there has to some, be some kind of show that you are, that there was a manual intervention there. And then when the receiver gets that, uh, gets that email back, then, um, well, then the original message gets through. So that's easy concept, but it doesn't work. Again, here uh, we know sender addresses are routinely faked, so all these challenge messages just go to innocent users who uh, are annoyed by them. And this has the side effect again, or the nice side effect, you, you think, that uh, 
users of these challenge response systems are now finding themselves on blacklists for <laughs> spamming. And so yeah, this, uh, these, uh, if you believe that spam is now more than 50% of, of, of email, then about 50% of, there's 50% of just useless, annoying mail being sent to innocent users. Spammers are getting smarter and smarter and they can actually fake their emails to get around these authentication uh, mechanisms. They can analyze email traffic and figure out who talks to whom and guess what kind of sender addresses are already, might already be authenticated or figure other ways around that. So spammers really, if, if they are a little bit intelligent at all, can figure out ways around these systems. The other problem is, is just at the concept that apparently two people who use these systems can never start talking to each other because the second system would just send back a challenge and the other guy is not going to accept the challenge. So there has to be some sort of a loopholes in these systems that the challenge messages of the other system can get through your own challenging system without any challenge. And uh, of course, that is you can also exploit that if you are trying to, uh, to write spam or send some sort of a email through that you do not want to be checked. <laughs> and uh, challenge response systems would also re require installing loopholes in, in spam filters so your challenges are not filtered as spam. And anytime you are uh, requiring installing a loophole, uh, loopholes can be exploited. S uh, challenge response systems actually facilitate phishing. Imagine everyone used challenge response systems. And then if you <coughs> want to uh, fish for email addresses or do anything of that sort or just want to verify email addresses. You just send someone a challenge message and if they click OK or uh, respond to it, then you know the email address is live. And so this really would hurt even the in more inexperienced users even more than anything else because then they would just click on everything and that is of course what they're not supposed to do. And then you also have to consider that uh, tracking these challenge response systems. There's emails going back and forth and you have to keep track of all that. And those systems are installed on your, on the ISP, on the machine of your ISP and they have extent, keep track of extensive databases. They know when you received email, when you responded to email and what time you were home and these things. And that's just more and more data being gathered. So I guess you all know that the uh, challenge response systems are counterproductive. They lose email and uh, they really place the burden not on the spammers but on the regular users, which is the fundamental uh, flaw in this whole system. So I guess you all know that you, don't, you should not use them. So here are a couple of other, I have to hurry up a little, here are a couple of other ways that people have tried to fight spam, which is kind of weird. Um, I know someone um, who uh, they figured, well, I do not trust external lists of things to block, which is reasonable. And they figured, well, we do our own, and which of course does not work. You cannot, even if you have a large staff, you cannot keep track of all the email addresses being listed and delisted and all that manually. So that doesn't work. Either use public lists or you don't use them, but don't try to keep track of them yourself. Running a local Paizo server, I did not talk about Paizo. It's kind of a questionable concept in my mind, but running a local Paizo server which only lists uh, emails that you have already identified and then feeding that back into your own spam filter does not work because you do not get any, find any more spam or any less spam, you just find the same spam again. <laughs> Only throw off your whole scoring mechanism if you do it for, uh, through spam assessment, for example. Yeah, forgetting the MX backup, um, I don't think a lot of people use MX backups anymore uh, unless you're sort of a large ISP, but uh, Secure in your primary server and not secure in your MX backup is just stupid because spammers spam the MX backup first. Then there are a couple of, uh, some people do that, they just check for any kind of standards violation or there's rcignorant.org which is a DNS based uh, list or complaining if the subject line is not encoded properly and well that, that is nice if you want to do that but that doesn't have anything to do with fighting spam. So, you know, don't bother people about that. You can educate people about that on your own time, I guess, but you don't, you don't find any spam with uh, checking if the subject line is encoded properly. That has absolutely nothing to do with that, so 
consider not doing that. And then there was a funny case I, I saw a couple of weeks ago, actually. There was someone who, or a lot of people do that, apparently. They change their email address regularly. They, they change 2005 to 2006 in the end, and then they send an email to everybody who, uh, to, uh, so they change their contact information. And if you want to find this particular email that I'm thinking about, you can go to the uh, online mailing list archives of the Debian project, because the emails are in the archives there, and any spammer who harvests email from the Debian mailing list archive already has his new email address, so I guess they're getting all the spam again that they got in their old email address. Yeah, so pretty much, of course you can invent your own filters, but chances are they're not going to work or you're just going to annoy people with your own uh, private ideas, so stick to the ones that people know so we're all communicating on the same protocols. So that's the technical side. The other, so the other uh, problems with the email filtering is uh, the privacy. There's a lot more new data gathered that you might not like people to have. For example, word databases, Bayesian filter word databases, or any kind of statistics that you keep. You can look into that word database and see how many times people talk about Al-Qaeda simply. Gray listing databases also keep track of whom emailed whom at what time, and of course that information is available in different places too. You have the, log, the, the regular server log files already contain that information, but if you go into organizations that you know, they have very, uh, very strict uh, rules about what to do with their log files. They can only keep them for a certain time, and they have to be encrypted, and they have to be stored away and hidden in, in, a, in, a, locked, uh, in a locked room, but they don't know anything about these other databases. The, Bayesian databases and the gray listing databases, and they're not secured at all, or they don't even exist officially, and all the information in there is not uh, secured at all. There is, um, what I did not talk about is um, a, a filtering mechanism called DCC, Distributed Checksum Clearing House, which counts how many times an email has been sent on the internet, and if you follow their uh, theory, then if an email has been sent more than an, a certain number of times, maybe one million, then it might be considered bulk email. And that, I think that works well, and but the problem you have there now, if you get an email, you can check how many times that email has been sent. So if you get an email from your business partner for Christmas, as has been popular in the last couple of weeks, and you can check how many times that email has been sent, and then you can see how many business partners that guy has, for example. So that kind of thing you also have to consider. I mentioned the uh, challenge response transaction records also being kept and probably not secured. And as I mentioned, using SPF and blocking port 25, one or the other or both, and ISPs can control which way you have your, which way you route your email and making sure you send it through their server logs, uh, through their server which is locked and they forward it directly to the NSA. And all of this is controlled not by you, but by the ISP, and the ISP does not particularly care about your privacy, at least uh, most of them don't, so all this database gathering is uh, done in your ISP, and you do not, you cannot control it. Now, if, if you uh, listen, uh, I mentioned I was at, con at a congress on, on spam fighting in, in Köln uh, in September, and apparently what people are new, doing now, if they start a new spam initiative, they first they do is, the first thing they do is build a database. And nowadays, everybody is building databases. Starting with the spam filter manufacturers, of course they have big, uh, huge uh, databases of spam just to tune their products, of course. But now you also see governments and industry associations uh, building databases of spam, and they ask you to forward their spam to them. You've, Maybe you have heard of the Federal Trade Commission in the US, they have an email address where you can forward spam. And in Germany, that's, it's rather new. You have the ECO, which is the, um, association, uh, the um, association of German internet enterprises, and the Wettbewerbszentrale, which is a fair trade uh, organization in Germany. And this is just a couple of examples in, in other countries too, uh, likely. And with that, you don't know what they do with that. Once they gather that, they can, you know, they know at what time you were home, and who tried to email you, and, and what email client you use, and what IP address you had at a, at, a, at a particular time. And ever since the EU data retention directive, uh, this is sort of a trivial, I guess, but 
these are additional databases that keep getting built and which allow people to profile you. And these are going to be uh, shared internationally. There's already a, a so-called European spam box project underway which basically discusses or protocols or ways these, all these databases can be shared so you get more databases and bigger databases. And those are impossible to control. If you think the, about these uh, things that are now being discussed in, uh, for the EU data retention directive, those things will likely be able to control and uh, be able to be controlled in, in some way because they are sort of an official database being um, established for purpose of, of tracking criminals, supposedly. But these databases are just uh, voluntary in a way, and uh, nobody can control what's being done with them. There is fortunately recourse in a, this is based on German law, but it's likely similar in, in most of the EU because it's based on EU uh, directions. Spam filtering in general is not allowed without the user's consent, and that is, uh, it's different for virus filtering. Virus filtering is, uh, you, uh, ISPs can do that as a sort of a self-defense mechanism. But spam filtering is not allowed at all without uh, the user's consent. And this not only includes discarding um, spam, this includes adding headers and changing the subject line or even just gray listing and, and delivering the email 15 minutes later. All of this is not allowed based on telecommunications regulation and Fernmeldegeheimnis and these things. So what ISPs must do is they have to tell people about what they are doing with their email. This is usually probably hidden somewhere in the business rules or allgemeine Geschäftsbedingungen or things like that. Or people have to activate filters themselves by checking some sort of a box, please filter my email. So you really have the opportunity to uh, know <coughs> what is going on with your email in terms of um, filtering or restricting it or changing it. As usual in these cases, most users are not going to care. The regular end user is just glad that they don't get any spam and they will check filter on my email. But uh, So this is sort of a call to you, maybe the more experienced users, to spread the word and then tell people what is happening with the email and where the da data is being collected and in which ways their communication is being restricted. So to conclude, in my opinion, email is uh, very unreliable already today. Much of this, what I've talked about, is also based on personal experiences, just in my own email box. Users uh, are starting to accept that email is unreliable. They say, well, I don't think I got your email. I think my spam filter ate it. Could you send it again, or could you call me up? And this is really a, a bad development. People are looking for alternatives to email. They are using instant messaging or sending fax, uh, using the fax machine or voice over IP or what have you, or SMS. <laughs> to blame are, of course, those people who send spam or viruses, but I think the application uh, the, of inappropriate junk email filters, annoying people through challenge response systems or bounce messages or restricting their communications in certain ways. If you, if, if you can't send email on the first try because something is blocked, chances are you're not gonna try again, just call the person up. So if you are implementing uh, email filters, check what you're doing first. Do not install everything. Do not believe everything Spam Assassin installs for you, or do not believe all the options that your program gives you. Uh, check what each technique is doing and how this impacts yourself and your users. Check all the, if you work in an ISP, check all the databases that you have, that they're secured. Check that the gray listing database is secured and all these other things and check what your ISP is doing with your email or the email of your associates. Okay, that is all. <laughs> Any important questions? Because I think we have to kind of clear out for the next people. Okay, thanks.